on um, on the on the YouTube uh, after this. So I'm really delighted to be hosting um, the this three webinars in one day for the three different um, core time zones across across our globe to engage with uh, communities. Um, and to share with you our new platform for walkable communities, Pathway to Walkable uh, Cities, to hear from different actors around the globe who are taking action for walking and to invite you to contribute to this new resource, this open resource. We're going to start with a quick uh, overview. I'm going to share with you some static slides of the new platform. Um, it's too hard to do a live, you know, action sort of dive into it. And so I've just got some snapshots to share with you the elements of the platform and, um, and then talk about its origins and our ambitions for that. And then we're going to hear from uh, a local advocate about conditions. And obviously the conditions vary greatly. So each of our case studies and our advocacy presentation is snapshots from different communities within this particular uh, region and uh, to, to gather an understanding and to find those shared experiences and potential for cross learnings. And our case studies will illustrate some exemplar actions which are underway to improve walking and to embed good policy and practice in um, administrations. So, this started, uh, it seems so long ago that the COVID-19 pandemic happened, but it's still real and it's still impacting lives around the world. But what it also did was highlighted the importance of walking and places to walk, but it also revealed a real gap in the visible data around walking. And it spurred a number of projects for us to leverage off uh, of that moment to really look at the governance and the data and the um, visibility of walking and the, and the understanding of the value of walking in, um, in cities and communities around the world. So we've been working to fill that knowledge gap and to improve that visibility of ex with existing knowledge, celebrating some good practice and inspire more investment in walking. So what is critical to understand is that we're not focusing on the delivery outcomes on the street. There's lots of really great work going on around that, and it's part of this story. But we are also focusing on the governance models, the policies, the action plans, the investments and ambitions within administrations, as well as the delivery on the street, because sometimes that delivery can take a lot longer than we all want it to take, or that delivery can, can only happen in small stages. So we're not measuring success um, just by that, but by that those steps that government are taking and how we can grow momentum for, for more um, investment by recognizing those important first steps and, um, and embedding the value and uh, the value of walking as part of their holistic approach to how we manage our streets, our public spaces, our urban life and our transport systems. I'd like to be uh, to acknowledge uh, the support of the FIA Foundation, who has backed us to deliver on this work and to to bring um, the visibility of walking on onto this onto this platform. So we have four speakers today, but let me take you on a quick journey through the through the platform. And as I, I said, the ambition is to recognize action, to reward and promote towns and cities that value and invest in walking through good governance to inspire ambition, to demonstrate how administrations are taking action and to celebrate the impact that they're having, showcase their good practice. We want to make things more visible so people know and understand what's really happening because a lot more is happening than people realize. And we want to grow momentum. And this is a really good example of that because part of the work we did uh, in the sort of post pandemic or during pandemic was to take, um, to, to inspire, uh, action within the African continent was to find local case studies so that it wasn't always importing ideas from elsewhere, but find where those ideas had been developed and delivered within Africa, and also look at the evidence and the data sets that were available to inform um, the decision making around that. So some of this work has already come into this publication, and you'll find some of these case studies and examples reflected in the platform as well, because these projects were developed um, in parallel. So the platform Pathways to Walkable Cities has three main um, components, the case studies, which uh, we'll talk about today, the global walking indicators, which I'll talk about next, and the um, international uh, charter for walking is also captured there because that's one of Walk21's 
sort of core documents that we've used for communities and agencies all over the world to actually know what to ask for. Way back in 2006, when we were still creating the conversation around walking at Walk 21, um, the, uh, we developed the International Charter to provide that guidance and that inspiration about what needs to happen. If we were writing it today, it might be very different, but actually the what is in there is still the core of delivering on, uh, on walkability. And so we're tracking signatories around the world as ministers, mayors, national transport agencies and individuals sign the, sign the charter. Oops, sorry, let's go back. The other gap we said earlier is, is about data. What do we know? People are always saying, we don't have enough information to make decisions. We don't know enough about walking. We don't have the data. And we've looked at lots of different data sets, lots of different indicators um, and measures for success. And some groups have 247 urban indicators of which walking is a significant component. We developed 36 in three tiers to try and make it more uh, graspable. And we got really Tired. I've worked on a couple of global projects like the Transport and Climate Change Global Status Report, looking at what the available indicators are, what those indicators should be. And then we just thought, hang on a minute, instead of constantly trying to demand and ask and look for, uh, go out and measure, what do we already know? What do the existing global data sets tell us? about walking um, already. And so we went looking, what are those existing global data sets? Well, WHO has a global data set around safety and activity and policies. It, uh, and then the UN Habitat, oh, if someone could mute their microphone, that would, uh, that would help. Um, thank you. Um, and then the UN Habitat is responsible for SDG uh, target 11.2, which is about proximity to public transport. So we took that as a, a measure of accessibility and uh, the International Road Assessment Program, IRAP, have uh, what we've called comfort because they measure the availability of infrastructure. And when 83% of roads that pedestrians are using in Africa don't have sidewalks, you've got an infrastructure problem, you've got a comfort problem, which manifests as well as a, as a safety problem. And we also did a broader dive into the policy to, to have a look at where the policy was. And so we've captured in the platform these that what's available in the existing global databases to tell us about walking and mapped, uh, you call them radar diagrams or spider diagrams for each country to give a national picture. Now we're very aware that this is only the first slice of this data. It has its limitations. We've already had people arguing about the, the, the material that we've put up. We're very open to having a conversation about this. This is an evolving piece of work. Um, this is the first uh, presentation of this information for us to continue to develop. And if something is wrong here, please tell us, come to us and we can we can update the the uh, the database with the new information. Then the other dimension, which is the one we're going to focus on for the for the webinar today, is the good governance, good practices. And we populated the map initially with a, a, a slice of case studies from the work that we were doing and from the material through the Walk 21 conferences and things like this. But we identified eight categories and Andre will know these very well because we've actually worked directly with the city of Rotterdam um, running workshops using these eight steps, but also with some regions and cities in the Asian um, region as well and Latin America. And what we identified by looking at the different success stories in cities and communities across the world, there was sort of some core elements that are part of the process of delivering successful walkable cities and communities. Now, this is not a step-by-step -step process and uh, we're very clear to call it a pathway rather than steps because a step suggests that you take one before you can take the next. And what we find happening is that people are doing multiples of these at one time. They might start at number seven and move back to the beginning. It's not a linear chronological process, but it's understanding all these elements. And some of them might all happen within one project. But we just felt this captures the core components of, of good governance. And just so that's a commitment to doing something. It's doing the research and understanding the walking that is happening in your community already, the motivations and destinations and things like that. It's about involving the local community and engaging them in the process. It's about assessing um, the environment, understanding 
auditing the physical environment in which we're asking people to, to walk. Um, and then reviewing all the policies, regulations, guidance that actually impacts on decisions and delivery of walkable communities, right up to legislation. So Berlin has brought in new legislation around walking. WHO is looking at how legislation could support more, more walking. But very often the legal frameworks prevent local authorities from doing what they want to do to make improvements. So this is critical. And, it's, and then having looked at all of those things, the planning stage, the developing up the plan, and we heard this morning from uh, Queensland how having a plan has leveraged resources and attention and engagement in a way that they couldn't have anticipated prior to doing so. But it's critical in the planning process that it's a multidisciplinary cross-agency and engaging the community process, because a lot of people don't see that what they're doing has an impact on walkability, and this, this buys ownership in that respect. Number seven is to prove it, invest, whether it's a big deal Times Square, sort of paradigm shifting project, or lots of small acupuncture projects around a city to make local improvements. And finally, of course, that investment, that commitment, that taking everything in everything forward and continuing to, to then circle back on any of these steps and continue delivering. So these are the categories and, and when projects come in and case studies come in, they're not limited to one of these, it could be multiples, but these were the framing that we've used for the project. And then you can have um, some different case studies. And I was going to bring, here's Nigeria. So each in the platform, you can bring up your country, you can understand um, the, the country profile based on those global indicators that I talked about, but also then some good practice. And here we've got an example from Lagos, um, and that's the case study. So this is the initial step stones in the, in the database, and then we will start to lift these out into a scrolling, um, a carousel of case studies and things as we, as we progress with the development of the database. And so just finally, this is my invitation to you to put your policy on the map, to submit your case studies, to share your, your knowledge. We're going to be inspired by our speakers, uh, but we're going to continue to promote the pathway and to support peer-to-peer -peer learning with the resources and, and commitments on there, and then look to a reward um, and recognition program as part of that, both for administrations and also for communities taking action, because sometimes some of that good governance starts in the communities and, and, and like the, the um, open streets uh, programs and things like that, sometimes they're very strongly community led and, and we look at the, some of those relationships. So thanks very much. That's a quick overview of the uh, platform. And uh, we are going to start now. We're going to hear from our local advocate and then from our government um, and, and uh, agency speakers about the work that they're doing. And um, put your questions in the chat as you go. Our speakers will respond to things related to their specific presentations. But after the presentations, we will have time for a more generalized discussion to draw um, some, some shared threads and, and shared understanding. So with that, and with no for, further ado, and now that I've turned off my presentation, I can see that there's 73 of us, which is absolutely lovely to, to see you all. And I can see some of you. It's always nice to see the familiar names and faces. So let me pass immediately to Constant Cap. Many of you will know uh, Constant. He's currently Senior Project Manager at Code for Africa, which is looking at an environmental monitoring program, but he also regularly writes and comments about urban planning issues. And he's gonna be our voice for the walking community um, in today's presentation. So Constant, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Brown, and, and good morning, or good afternoon, depending on uh, your particular location or time zone, as was introduced earlier on. I'm Constant Kapp. I'm based in Nairobi, an urban planner by profession. And I'll be telling you a bit about the Nairobi or uh, Kenyan experience from an advocacy point of view. I'll look at uh, four key areas, one of which is uh, an overview of the current situation, uh, some of the key issues, and then some of the key issues or challenges that uh, we face as far as walking is, is concerned. Um, some of the opportunities and ideas uh, based on, you know, experiences that we've had or experiences that I've had, as well as experience of other people in the sector. And then also, we'll, I'll touch a bit on some of the aspects that uh, we've seen uh, uh, the champ uh, champions in government and the public sector covering. Uh, the image you see there is... Uh, section of the uh, central business district in, in, in Nairobi. And 
looks a bit green and it's, it's currently green because it's been also raining very very heavily the last couple of days so let me move to the next okay sorry yeah i think the introduction was done so i'll talk a bit about the current situation of walking in, in, in especially in Nairobi. Well, you look at this uh, particular image and you see three kinds of uh, neighborhoods. Uh, to the south, uh, to, towards south of the highway, uh, slightly south of the highway, you have an informal settlement called, uh, that some of you may have heard of called uh, Madare. And uh, north of the highway that uh, cuts across the image is um, upmarket settlement uh, called Muthaiga, while towards the, the west is an area called uh, High Ridge. Now, the difference between these three areas is that in Madare, you may have up to 700 people uh, or more per square kilometer. Whereas in uh, uh, Mutaiga, north of the highway, you'll have seven people per square kilometer. Then towards the east, so towards the west, and also towards the real down south, you may have you know, about 60 to 70 people per square kilometer. And this portrays some of the spatial differences we have in, uh, in not only in, in Nairobi, but in many of the global south cities. You know, um, on one end, you have people, you know, con uh, living in very many poor people living in congested neighborhoods. On another side, you know, people in uh, what we may call leafy suburbs or lush areas with a lot of space and with uh, better access access to services. And how does this affect walking? You find that because of these uh, differences, we end up with a very interesting model split, which is up to an average in most of our cities of 53% of people using uh, non motorized transit, mainly walking as their daily trips in Nairobi, I think it's uh, at around 48, in Kisumu it's 57, in Mombasa 56%. And it may look like something very exciting, you know, because we're all trying to promote walking. But the, the, you know, part of the reason why this happens is not because, is because people may have no other choice. You know, the poor people who are living in that small area you see south of the, the highway have no choice but to walk very long distances on, on a day-to-day -day, uh, day basis. Then we, we, we have, uh, sorry, we have, you know, all kinds of extremes of our uh, current working situation. You know, this image taken here is an example of some of the working infrastructure in the Nairobi Central Business District that, you know, is, is, is very good, is, is a lot of space. But this, you know, at times is reserved to uh, some of these key areas, you know, that uh, will stand out for, 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 for the city, like the central business district, some upmarket neighborhoods. Whereas in, you know, in, in some of the, the, the poorer areas, you find here uh, a bit more, a lot more congestion and very little space for people to, to walk, you know, very poor uh, crossing infrastructure, very poor linkage between uh, public transport or paratransit and uh, walking infrastructure. And the most vulnerable end up being uh, some of the uh, the, uh, the least uh, well served as far as walking infrastructure is concerned. So in a place like uh, here, this, this image, uh, you know, an informal settlement that may have you know, thousands of people who walk as their primary means, you'll, you'll notice that compared to the other, the other images like in the central business district, the image you see, you find that there's hardly any walking infrastructure. Even, you know, people are, you know, are, are kind of squeezed up and you can't even differentiate between the, the driving and the walking infrastructure. The, 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 the roads may be bad, poor for cars, but at the same time, you know, you can see those kids there, it's, it's not like they have on, on, on the left of your, on the right of your screen, it's not like they have the best of, of walking uh, facilities. And you can imagine how those people who are physically, the people with disability, the elderly have to endure walking in, in, in such conditions. However, you know, you still have some, some positive, you know, efforts. This is um, uh, recently constructed uh, bridge that you know some form of public space was was developed there. You know, this is an upmarket area where very good uh, uh, working infrastructure was uh, recently introduced, linking it, and then some lower no, lower income area where you know separate walking path has been developed. So you have those kind of variances where in some places, some some parts of the city, you have very poor, extremely poor walking infrastructure, whereas in in in, in others, you know you have good. So good infrastructure. The key issues, you know, you can see here, air pollution is one big challenge to people who uh, have to walk because they, you, you know, you have a lot of vehicular congestion, industrial congestion, and then many people walking and you have that kind of, you know, air, air pollution being a major, major challenge. Safe crossing infrastructure, you know, and, and road safety becomes a very key, key challenge. And people, you know, end up crossing the roads in, in, uh, haphazardly, uh, dangerously. And as a result, we have 
up to 36% of our annual fatal road fatalities are, to, are to, pe to pedestrians. And even, and then we also have other challenges of projects that are introduced into the city and end up reducing the quality of road infrastructure or, or road projects of, of walking infrastructure or road projects that are done and the quality and, and they do not have enough emphasis on uh, walking infrastructure. And a good example is you can see on your screen an overhead highway that was put and you know is being talked very highly by people in, in the public sector as modern infrastructure that's you know, going to transform the city. But the result also was this on the lower side of the highway, you know, where where the, the, the walking infrastructure and the cycling infrastructure was literally destroyed and forgot and forgotten about. And uh, it's only, you know, and same thing here, you see, um, this is alongside the, uh, just after, after that particular highway, you can see there's a fence in between this road. Um, and this is what has been left to, for people uh, to walk. We also have very poor linkage with public transport. You see um, here, the, the, the public transport vehicle or paratransit Matatu is you know, forced to just stop on the road to uh, get passengers. And you can see there's really nowhere for these passengers to walk on, on uh, to walk or access this, this public uh, infrastructure. Of course, with such kind of highways, we have problems of speeding, you know, and illegal pickup and drop, drop of zones uh, for, for people who are walking and want to use public transport, as, and also problems of awareness. Okay, this is another example of that uh, the Nairobi Expressway, the, where you know one of the pillars blocks just block blocked the walking infrastructure near the, the central central business district, and then also lack of awareness from people. And, and you know here we have an image of you have a pedestrian bridge. Fine, we may not we prefer to promote um, uh, tabletop crossings over pedestrian bridge infrastructure uh, bridges, but even here you have a pedestrian bridge. But these people would rather walk, you know, along uh, cross the highway itself. You know, at times even these pedestrian bridges don't have universal access. You can see that person there is holding a crutch. Um, he, it, it, it is that this particular bridge does not have a proper ramp for him to, to, to climb in order to get to where he wants to. Again, another image here, people crossing the road you know, dangerously because poor, uh, crossing infrastructure has not been considered when some of these highway projects are, are, are done. Um, another challenge at the public sector is we have very many, and this image I would like to thank CDKN, Climate and Development Knowledge, uh, Development Knowledge Network, who put it together, that shows you the multi-level governance that touches on non-motorized transport. So you have all these different um, bodies that are touching on non-motorized transport. And sometimes, you, you know, you may find that, that it, it, they, they may be, seem too many and, and they may not have the, all that focus on improving of, of, of walking, walking infrastructure. However, there are still many opportunities and, and, and ideas that, that, that do exist uh, in, in, uh, as far as uh, walking is concerned. And some of these can be done particularly by people in, uh, who are not necessarily in the public sector. And that's where advocacy work comes in and champions come in. And we've seen these being done in different parts of the world through the exam uh, uh, activities like placemaking, peer learning, campaigns, media engagements, uh, tribunals, uh, people going to the tribunal to question um, certain infrastructure, organizing car free days and different kinds of, of, of research, okay? And uh, this is here, you have an example of uh, Nairobi Placemaking Week in 2016. And at the moment, you know, this particular, um, you know, where streets are closed and different form, where the street is turned into a lab and different forms of tests are taken, uh, taken, uh, taken along that street, you know, what's the impact on business? If you have more an improved pedestrian way, what's the impact on air quality? And many, many times this has led, even on this particular street uh, in Nairobi, to improve pedestrian, uh, pedestrian uh, access, improve pedest uh, widen pedestrian paths for people to, to move around. Uh, using placemaking to improve uh, the pedestrian experience. This is a, a recent piece of art that was done at last month in Nairobi. And, along one of the pedestrianized uh, streets and you know people can stop there and even just get to appreciate you know certain aspects of, of, of art along along the street uh, use of street furniture also uh, uh, can be used as a way of improving uh, the pedestrian experience engaging in media I, sorry I, I use myself because I don't have permission to use other people who've <laughs> talked about these topics but uh, yeah engaging in media and questioning you know why we can't have improved uh, non-motorized transit in, and, and always mentioning whenever you have the, the chance, you know, the, on the importance of non-motorized transit, giving people these statistics. Many people don't even know that 
we have such large numbers of, of pedestrians and, and, and cyclists and that the majority of the citizens actually walk to work. Taking part in research, this is a research project I'm currently involved in where we are co-designing solutions to improve mobility for vulnerable users. It's called Equitable Health and for Mobility and Wellbeing with the Stockholm Environment Institute and uh, at the University of York and working in, in partnerships with the, the county government of Nairobi and the county government of Mombasa. And we are asking people, vulnerable, uh, people from vulnerable groups, you know, persons with disability, the elderly, women, children, what are the challenges they have? Uh, in their mobility and using you know those as, as ways of co-designing solutions to make their experience much 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 better and and then also you know advocating for improved biking facility which is also very important um, because once we have better biking facilities we tend to have better walking facilities within within our cities car free days can also be organized as ways of people getting to appreciate the value of the streets much, much, much more. And that was Nairobi a few days ago. Urban greenery to improve the experience of uh, people who are walking along, uh, along the streets because you know, this also leads to improved, uh, improved air quality. And, and this is a street that was recently uh, pedestrianized about three years ago and used to be congested with, with public transport. And one of the outcomes of this has been almost as, uh, over 50% improvement in business services improvement in, in health of the, the people who work along the street. And, and this is, we, we have you know, data that we ask the people who are involved. What are some of the approaches that people uh, that we've seen from uh, those in government? Okay. Um, very recently, the Minister of Transport you know, uh, said, and this uh, you know, was just uh, November 19th from a, a Kenyan newspaper that under the new policy that you know, all uh, roads should have lanes for non-motorists, such as pedestrians. This is from the new Minister of, uh, of Transport, which is a very big win for all of us who've been campaigning for improved uh, walking, walking facilities. We've also seen uh, through some peer, peer learning, this is a former uh, Minister of uh, Transport in, in, in Mombasa. We've seen in Mombasa County a lot of championing of improved uh, facilities. For example, this model that uh, he, he talked about, how they can create calf, uh, school uh, safety zones and we saw it being put in place so and, and, and this is being shown as a as a very good example of ways of improving uh, walking facilities for you know children who have to walk, walk to school it's uh, only i think last week the government announced uh, kenya announced that um, all primary schools will have to be day schools we have a history of uh, boarding schools in this country and and now with, with that announcement that primary schools will have to be day schools now there's even more need for all of us to advocate for more uh, safety uh, around primary schools so that children can safely access schools and use Mombasa as an example. This is an example from Nairobi, uh, that same street that uh, you had seen the place making activity on improved on how you know the city has gone ahead uh, to, to improve the pedestrian experience within within the city. And then also you know uh, creating speed limits, especially around the uh, school areas or places that have uh, many people walking through. And another example from the city of Nakuru where. Uh, there has also been a renewed emphasis on uh, creating a better pedestrian uh, experience. And you can see there are tabletop crossing and uh, street furniture, and also a wider wider pedestrian uh, uh, pedestrian path. So there, there are many opportunities that, 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 that uh, we may have. There are many things that we can do. And it's important that we ensure that people at the grassroots have this understanding. So you know, highly you know, recommend that we hold urban dialogues with communities. We, make people be, to be aware of the importance of and the rights of, of pedestrians. We try to use highly influential people, including people at ministerial level, et cetera. Um, have case studies like this Nakuru, Mombasa, and Nairobi experiences can be used also to, to expand uh, walking infrastructure. Promote the benefits of walking. You know, people sometimes look down upon walking as something for the poor and those who cannot afford to, to have cars, but we have to promote the benefits of walking. Okay. And uh, you know the Mombasa experience has been to create uh, what they call a red carpet, have the uh, walking infrastructure in red, so that people can uh, you, you give improved. Uh, you, you see them as you, you see the people walking as VIPs, so you give them like a, uh, almost like a red a red carpet. And then also you know that messaging, we constantly have to have that messaging that you know walking is a, everybody has to walk in one way or another. Okay, even that person who drives still has to walk, and that's the need for last mile and, and improved uh, be benefit for all who are working at whatever level in society. Thank you very much.
Fantastic. Thank you, Constant. That was a great overview of both the good and the not so good. Even when you had a picture of the speed sign, we could see the uh, the, the pedestrian infrastructure was was certainly created by the community, if not co-created with the uh, with the authority, with the uh, the tracks and the pathways through the grass on the left there. So that gives us a sense of the challenges and the and the conditions, particularly in Nairobi and some other cities in Kenya. So thank you very much for that. This is a Europe and Africa webinar, so we have some very different snapshots from, from some from some very different cities, and uh, we're going to go now to Rotterdam and hear from Andre De Witt, and he is currently their mobility advisor at the Urban. Um, development Department, and he's been working there uh, since 2007, but since 2020, he's been part of the integral team looking at walking in the city of Rotterdam. And I understand from Andre, he's going to give us a little bit of history, as well as uh, some insights into the future and the work that they're doing for walking in the city of, of Rotterdam. And thanks everyone for your input on the chat. Um, it's I'm capturing some of that to bring through to our conversation, but also please keep up that. That's also very interesting. Over to you, Andre. Thank you. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Roman. Good afternoon, everybody. Good morning. I'm going to share my screen now, and I hope everybody will see the screen and will hear my voice. I hope so. Yes, all great. We okay. can see. Yes, yeah, there we are. Perfect. Okay. Great. Uh, well, thanks for having the opportunity to share our story, the Rotterdam story. Uh, I heard from Constant already some issues that will also be in my presentation as well. Uh, I'm going to talk you through our the evolution of our uh, walking uh, approach, but it has also to do with our uh, evolution of our city. So that's why I have a, need a bit of history. Uh, first, some figures about the city of Rotterdam today. It's the second city of the Netherlands, and we have about 650,000 inhabitants 2021 and actually um the model share the constant just said was 53 percent we in rotterdam we have two figures about our model share walking that's based on mode change in the chain so by the when people change over from public transport to another uh, uh, mode then our model share is 34 percent and if it's both uh, based on the entire trip it's 30 percent that's walking so that's are the figures now um, and what I already told, uh, we have to dive into our history because Rotterdam was built up uh, after the bombing in the war, was built up through this spatial scheme. Uh, we had a, after the bombing in the, after the Second World, we had a blank sheet and the people then designed our city in an American kind of way and anticipating the next revolution in, in, in mobility that was the car. So there were a lot of broad streets, boulevards, and well, that's, that, that's the way it developed. Uh, not knowing that uh, 50 years later, there would be about 8 million cars in the Netherlands and the street would look like this. Uh, so in the city center, we had a lot of cars, few people, there were only in, in the 2000s or 1995, there were only 20,000 people living in the city center. Uh, so we had to do something else uh, and that's, was 2008, uh, the big game changer was the inner city plan and the introduction of the city lounge is an idea. Uh, the city lounge was more des uh, designed uh, through the soft themes and not the hard infrastructural themes. So it has to do with uh, meeting people, walking and uh, enjoying the city. Uh, and also we started to densify our city. Um, to we put down uh, a lot of uh, buildings, a lot of towers. Uh, and since 2002, the number of inhabitants raised with 25%. So that raises, uh, then we realized that we just didn't need a city lounge approach, but we needed the broad uh, policy to create healthy and attractive cities. And also based on the 40, 50 minutes, uh, 50 minutes approach. So then a big, a big uh, change was the Rotterdam mobility approach, um, which introduced the paradigm shift, not designed for cars first, but designed for walkers first and design inclusive. 
So everybody who uh, uses the the walkway should be, should be uh, facilitated. So that gave us the opportunity to to sign this international charter for walking. One person on the figure, uh, the, the photograph you probably recognize. The other person is our alderman and vice uh, mayor at that time, uh, Judith Bockhover. She signed the international charter. That gave us the opportunity to put down a real uh, policy uh, and to put the pedestrian on a pedestal. And in our Rotterdam Walks uh, document, we uh, launched three objectives. Uh, and the one, uh, the one important one is we had to uh, make people walk uh, more often and for farther distances, and also try to get up the, the model shift for walking. Uh, we then identified three tracks uh, in which we want to reach those goals. And I'm gonna uh, mention the tracks and some uh, initiatives and activities in these tracks now. Uh, link in place is the first. Um, uh, the first thing we want we started with is uh, to formulate designing principles for the pedestrian. We're currently working on it. We hope to uh, publish them January uh, coming year. And uh, we have two walking conditions. Uh, you have to be able to walk and it has to be attractive to walk. And these are the conditions we, uh, we use. Attractiveness, it has to be healthy, it has to be accessible, inclusive, and also safe and comfortable. Uh, so that's what we're uh, uh, designing now. Uh, so in that way, we can improve infrastructure. This we already did. Um, this is one uh, street in the south where the, the crossover was, wasn't, that, uh, wasn't that good and also was combined with bicy bicyclists. So we changed this over, made it uh, broader, uh, even uh, more visible. So you get a safe uh, crossing. Uh, also, what I said, road safety is an important condition. These are two <laughs> pictures for and after. So you see the big improvement of walking, still some trees in the way, but still you need some green as well. Um, and we have another plans going. This is an uh, artist impression of uh, the Hofplein. It's one of the bigger squares in the city center. And um, we're gonna design the square uh, with a lot of green, a lot of places to stay, and actually the crossing will, won't be regulated by uh, traffic lights, but only with uh, crossings like this. So we're very, uh, we're really anticipating how this is gonna work. And uh, well, this is an ex a very good example of, of the place you wanna, we wanna have in this city. Uh, awareness and promotion. A constant already uh, mentioned this, this, uh, this issue. Uh, we do it in a number of ways. And also I wanna mention we have in all these tracks, we collaborate uh, internally in, inside our, our uh, uh, municipality, as well as partners outside. Uh, we are uh, collaborating in the city deal with other cities uh, in the Netherlands. And we also uh, try to uh, collaborate with, with uh, organizations. And we also wanna collaborate with the people. And this is one example uh, which my colleague Jose Besselink started in Overschie. How you can uh, define the, the routes and nice places in a certain part of the city and how you can improve these kind of uh, routes. So this is with, with the people. It's really a nice bottom-up approach of how to, to, to improve the, the walking in, in, the, in, in your neighborhood. Um, then. We also have the meeting routes. That's a walking meeting. Uh, we started them last year in a specific, uh, fin in the financial district nearby the central station of Rotterdam. So you have four, uh, three routes you can walk with your colleagues and you can uh, easily, you can walk healthy and you can also uh, have the meeting. And um, this is, uh, we tried it now for a year, so it was very successful. Um, oh. Then knowledge and research. Uh, also, that is something uh, we uh, we need to have, definitely. 
and we started in I think it was 2020. It was only a few weeks before the the, the lockdown. We had a survey for three weeks, and we asked people where they like to walk and didn't like to walk. So we had this map with the black dogs, and uh, they, uh, as you expect, they they show the places where they don't people don't like to walk. And the pink dots they show where they do like to walk. Not surprisingly, they like green, they like water, and also they like the lack of cars. That's also a place they like to walk. So this you can use for uh, putting the agenda across <coughs> that rocking is really uh, important and that you can improve still a lot of things also in Rotterdam. Um, also, uh, we are developing uh, with Witte van den Bosch, is an engineering bureau, um, a prediction model for where the amount where a lot of people walk and where less people walk. So we want to have a hierarchy in our net network. And I also saw Daniel Sauter in the <clears throat> in the call. We had a collaboration and a meeting last because this is something we really need to make visible uh, where the what the network of the pedestrian is. And uh, this is the image we have now. Uh, yellow is a high intensity and purple is a low intensity. So this 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 um, gives you the the momentum to tell people these yellow lines they have to be in order because they they have to be accessible. There has to be enough space because people use them a lot. Um, so this is for getting priorities right. Um, and also, that's why you collaborated, maybe you know it, Promen, this uh, uh, research by uh, Rumble. Yeah, uh, we were uh, involved, yeah. Yeah, you were involved as well. So about how, uh, what are the needs and what are what are the current state of data about uh, walking and cycling in the, uh, a couple of European cities. Um, so really uh, dive into this because, like I said, what I normally say, we changed the paradigm shift uh, and we de designed for uh, the pedestrian, but we don't collect data in that way. Still, we use a lot of data for car. We don't, uh, and we don't use the data we have. That's also, like you said, Roman, we do have a lot of data, and but we don't use it a lot. So that's, that's another thing uh, we have to develop. Um, so uh, this is a uh, nice feature to, to dive into. Okay, that's, uh, that's my uh, story so far. Thank you. I like that. That's your story so far. I like the, <laughs> the suggestion that there's going to be more story and more, more to learn and to, to, to hear from uh, Rotterdam, which is really great. Absolutely. Um, I, I really like this, the, the thread that you shared here, Andre, which is you did, you did city lounges. And, and if I can be a bit more blunt, it was like, but but didn't create the routes for people to get there and to spend the time in, in the city in a different way. And I like the way you started with place and realized that mobility was an important um, dimension of that, of, of that process as well. And I think what we can see from a, an exemplar city like Rotterdam is you make that decision at the political commitment level, and then you just keep layering and layering the development and the sophistication and the understanding, and then and subsequently the delivery and the change on the street. It really, I mean, this is why we invite you to speak because <laughs> it's not that everyone is there yet, and that's the point of the platform, but these are the, these are the layers, and this is the way that we build up the, the knowledge and the learning within the city and embed those new design principles and um, and ideas that you that you have there. There's a couple of comments in the chat about your walking meeting routes and things like that. If you might like to pick those up as we go um, along as well. But there's some some lovely food for thought uh, in that presentation. So thank you very much for that. You're welcome. And I will look into the chat now. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. So we are going to move a little east and uh, go to Tirana in Albania. And I'm very pleased to invite Simon Battisti to present next. He's the executive director of the Relationship Center, otherwise known as QM, but I will leave him to pronounce um, that uh, the title because it's not in English, but it's I'd like to hear it, Simon, um, which is an, a nonprofit urban research and action group based in Tirana. And they're working on the School Streets program with the city. And he's going to be sharing that story with us and how that's growing momentum for a bigger walking plan. Simon Battisti, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. 
Um, yeah, thanks, Bronwyn. Thanks for the invitation to be here. Um, Chandra Mardanie, and I spell it out here for everyone <laughs> so you can read it phonetically at the bottom of the slide here. We can all practice today. Um, I'm going to talk today a little bit about how we are working on very much on the ground with the School Streets program in Tirana and how um, at the same time in parallel um, there's uh, really valuable work uh, taking place around writing policy that and the way that the two so far have interacted and very much um, is still a very sort of un unknown story. Um, so I think it's really important to start uh, with a photo like this of Tirana in 1988. Um, this is not a car free day. This is just every day um, where um, uh, private ownership of a car was not allowed. So the vast majority of the population in Tirana uh, walked and cycled and took buses for, for further distances. But driving was not a thing and car ownership was was just really um, it was not an issue. Um, and imagine decades uh, of this condition you know, the way in which walking would be understood as part of the daily pattern um, about how we would get around. Um, and for that reason, Tirana is a really fascinating case to think about um, walking in the city and um, especially with the interaction with the car, but, um, but very much it's a place where a lot of the conditions for walking are really already in place. And in a way we're moving backward toward um, pre-90s um, uh, as, as a goal um, in the way that, that uh, mobility works in the city. Um, and uh, so fast forward to today, this is a kind of very typical view um, outside of a school um, at the pickup period. Um, and as you can see, that walking tradition is very much in place. It's a compact city with very mild weather. There's a lot of really perfect conditions to have a very, very walkable city, except of course, for the presence of this car. And so the work that we do in the School Streets program um, as the NGO is very much simply trying to create space for pedestrians directly in front of the school, but of course, in a way that will also expand across the city and sort of link together eventually. Um, but um, this is, so, so the, you know, the, the condition in Tirana is very much one where people do walk in large numbers. People walk for a lot of their trips every single day, um, but they do so in a condition of being sort of chased by cars. They're constantly sort of, we are dodging um, uh, vehicles constantly. We're breathing the exhaust, um, we're subjected to the noise, um, and, uh, and, and, and in, in many cases, of course, there's, there's collisions with pedestrians and cyclists all the time. So this is the, so this is the, um, really the condition. And of course, um, since the, uh, since the nineties, when, um, when the market opened up and, uh, suddenly people could own cars, uh, Albania has grown in car ownership faster than almost any other country um, in Europe. And so it's an explosion of car ownership in a way, in, and, and in many ways, um, a, um, an explosion of car ownership that sort of caught everyone sort of off guard and quite unprepared. And I think that's a really important point as well, is that because walking is so taken for granted, until now, there really has not been a walking policy. Walking policy almost sounds absurd in a way um, in this context, because it was such a natural sort of everyday practice, the idea that you would need policy at the city or national level um, is, is a little bit odd and in and, and a, and, and a situation um, that has really only existed for you know, 15 years or so that the city really feels um, this intensively overrun by cars. So I'm just gonna show you a couple of slides about how the school streets work. Um, this is the most recently completed project. This is a um, this is a permanently constructed, or or in other words, a capital construction project um, in front of a school. So again, here is a, a before image of the street. Um, on the right side, you can see the uh, the school gate with the two red columns, um, and just absolute chaos. Way too much space for vehicles in the street. 
Um, this is the moment where the kids are getting in and out of the car and um, just totally unregulated space. Um, and this is uh, how it looks today, um, although it's a lot rainier and colder now. Um, but this is this is in September. Um, and it's a simple extension of the sidewalk space. We take a take away a lane of traffic, um, keep one lane uh, in, in moving in one direction of traffic, and the rest um, goes to pedestrians. And then we plant some vines and add some lighting and, and seating. Really, really simple um, kind of um, recipe uh, to make the space. But again, in a, in a city where with this kind of weather um, and uh, and oh here so even it works in the rain as well. So here's a street party that we that we threw, and so you can see that it really does become a place quite easily now. And I think this is one of the most exciting things about this project is that it is a route in in a sense, but it's only it's a it's a single city block, um, and so in a way it sort of um, it makes that last uh, that last fifty meters to the school gate de-stressed um, for kids and caregivers. Um, but it's also a place that, you know, this becomes a, a completely different um, calculation in terms of what you can create here, essentially. I mean, the, sort of anybody could throw a party, certainly the school, certainly any of those businesses, certainly any local NGO, including us, but also, you know, the city, like it just all of these opportunities um, are, are suddenly, um, available. So then um, what's really interesting and what we've been working on, sort of the innovation in terms of governance um, in, in this project is the way that the, um, the street is actually built. So um, this is a tweet from uh, 2016. Um, and what the, the, the text there says, um, they, uh, uh, referring to the workers, continue to work um, uh, through the coal uh, uh, in the Shalvarat neighborhood. They work in the cold and the rain to finish faster. And um, this is the this is the, the municipal department of uh, maintenance. This is this, this is street maintenance. Um, and uh, the, the point here is that these workers are not simply maintaining um, or repairing this sidewalk. In fact, they're expanding this sidewalk. They're widening. Uh, they're doubling the width of the sidewalk. And so way back then, in the very first term of this administration, they started sort of playing around with this idea that you wouldn't need to necessarily tender every, uh, every change to the streetscape. In fact, you could make uh, changes to the streetscape for health and walkability, let's say, um, with the municipal uh, maintenance departments. And so we as an NGO have sort of worked our way into this particular situation and tried to kind of tweak it um, by, we, we work, you know, we're, we're also architects, planners, and designers in a way. And so we add a little bit of extra twist into that situation, but essentially, we work um, on the school streets program within this logic of maintenance and within the um, within the material palette, within the technique, um, uh, within the, the the techniques and methods that are available to us through this workforce um, to create these new spaces. And um, of course, this is really beneficial as well because they're sort of made like they're designed ahead of time with maintenance in mind. Um, and so we really believe that that is a, a huge advantage for the durability of these projects. But the best thing about them is that they're just really, really inexpensive. Um, so by avoiding tendering, you know, this is the scale. This, I, I think for, for us, um, our theory is that this is the secret to scale. Um, there is no way that um, we would be able to afford to tender every one of these school street projects around the city, let alone then link them and you know have a kind of real kind of overhaul of the streetscape in, in Tirana at the scale that is necessary after so many decades of complete non-investment in, in the public realm, especially for walking and biking. Um, this, is the, this is the secret, uh, we think, that you expand the municipal maintenance departments run all of this work through them, build these capacities, and then 
you no longer need a local NGO either. This just becomes sort of standard practice within the city. Um, so that street that I showed you, this is the construction of that street, um, 13,400 euros in materials, bricks, uh, sand, and the labor is, you know, was, was um, donated in kind by the city. Of course, there's a cost to that, um, but within the logic of the way that the city should work, it's um, feasible. Um, versus an, an estimate of around 150,000 euros to be tendered. And of course, when you're tendering to private contractors, you have much less control over the quality of the, of the final product. It's very hard to get a private contractor to even go for a project of this scale. This for them is really sort of small potatoes. And if they don't have, if they don't put a bunch of these together, basically, it's not going to be really financial, financially feasible for them. The only contractors you might find are the ones who are really in sort of hard up for cash, you know, kind of dire straits situation where, and you're really going to get bad work um, in, in, in what we've experienced in the city. So, so that's, that's kind of the key. And um, I think what's really important then looking toward policy um, is the way in which demand on the ground from the public interacts with, um, with policy and put, works back and forth with policy. So pushes, uh, pushes policy makers to write policy, first of all, and then holds policymakers accountable for um, for enacting and and uh, you know protecting that policy and the integrity of that policy. Um, but for us, again, as a as a local NGO, it this is the key: is that policy does not sit on a desk, but rather it is linked uh, very closely with experience. And the experience of a street party, of course, there's no better way to build pure joy in a photo archive as well as a a, a part a, like a, a, the experience of of neighbors uh, in this neighborhood, who then hold this memory, and that is, in my view, sort of how accountability uh, can work. And so these two things really need to work together. Um, we are, I'm very confident that um, policymakers on their own are not gonna move fast enough uh, as fast as we need them to. Um, and it, it's, it's really essential that, um, that, this, that it works as a, as a two-way street. Um, okay, so, so finally, um, Tirana has, uh, been developing now a uh, a walking policy, um, and uh, uh, Jim is also working on this, uh, or leading this project um, with the with the local uh, with with GIZ and and a number of other agencies in the city, and this is a really really exciting moment because now we get to kind of combine all this stuff, um, and and so the kind of the the core. Um, uh, player and all of this thing is a is a new organization, um, uh, a walking task force, which combines all of the key agencies of the municipality with uh, decision makers, uh, deputy mayors uh, sit on that on that walking task force, as well as local NGOs um, and and other key stakeholders meet on a regular basis and um, start to share knowledge and build um, a kind of armature around holding ourselves and each other accountable um, toward, and, and, and really the political level of Tirana, uh, of the Tirana municipality is really who, you know, where, where it all goes, um, but have been able to really develop um, these four key policy points together. Um, and so this is just really, a, um, I think, Jim, I don't know if it's published yet, if it's totally official yet, but here's the um, here, here's it's how it works. Job. Okay, um, uh, yeah, and so so each one of these four uh, points also has um, action items, uh, kind of a policy context, and and really is now you know making like not allowing us to take anything for granted anymore. I think that's you know that's the key, is that we Great. we now have something concrete 
to move toward. Um, and again, it's 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 ping pong um, back and forth. And um, and I think uh, yeah. So so um, as as Andre said, the the story is still yet to be told. Um, but we're this is where we are today. Simon, that's absolutely fantastic. I didn't realize we we're getting a history lesson from both of our European cities, but it's really great to understand the context that how you didn't need a plan because you just had walking and, and, and how that has evolved. But I think I must admit my favorite piece from yours is expanding the pedestrian realm within the logic of repair. I think this is a little, little gem that is coming through here, this idea that it, you're doing maintenance work and just the maintenance requires a wider sidewalk and uh, the cost savings, the efficiencies, the local employment, um, the speed, all of these things. Um, there's a question in the chat about community pushback, which is something that we uh, all have to face from people who think cars should be everywhere. Um, and you might want to pick that up in the chat. But I wondered if you if this logic of repair means that you, you're creeping out some of this space without necessarily um, a lot of sort of uh, uh, sort of a high profile for it. It's lovely to showcase your shoots, your school streets. But does this mean you can just sort of widen the street, the widen the footpaths without too much, um, with a little less drama, perhaps? Or did, did you find definitely, that it, definitely? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, um, I I personally am, am, am you know more and more just completely unapologetic about this kind of stuff. I mean, I just don't think that that safe walking, especially in front of a school, but really anywhere in the city, I just I just don't think it's negotiable. And and therefore, I don't think that it's really worthwhile to spend a whole lot of time up front asking people permission uh, about whether or not we can do this. In the same way that we never ask permission about whether or not we can drive throughout the entire city. You know, like it was Great. just. Taken from yeah. So that's so, but but certainly um, the, within the the maintenance logic here, and the fact that it's these people doing it, and that it's really a, it's a really low cost, for me is a, also like completely, it, it's so justifiable. It's so like just just yeah. No, I think iron, it's a really ironclad defensible. You know, it, because there's so much corruption in tendering as well, as we know, like throughout the world. You know, that's like tendering is so much a system yeah. of yeah. Um, corruption. And I think it's so important to also work around that. Um, and I think that that's really an important thing to be transparent about for the public too. No, I think it's really, it's a really great point. And I think I, I'm going to leave us here, leave Tirana, because we do need to jump back to, um, to Africa for our last presentation. And we'll try and come back to some of these topics. But please um, the, pick up in the chat as well around the questions about this sort of, but where do we put our cars conversation that um, often happens as well. Yeah. Um, so we come to our final presenter and we've, we started in Africa with Constant. We've circled through some very interesting and slightly different cities um, up in the European um, context. And we come now to the city of Kisumu back in, in Kenya. And uh, we are going to hear from um, Judy Bala, who is a city planner with the city of Kisumu and has worked with the county government as well. She has is a master's student in environmental studies around climate change and sustainability. So lots of good things to share. Um, Judy, are you there? I can't actually now see you on my screen, I'm sure. But please go ahead and share your screen. The floor is yours. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can, and we can hear you as well. So please go ahead. Great, great. Uh, so as you've heard, my name is Judy Ballard. I work for the county government of Kisumu as a city planner. And so I was I requested to make a presentation on the governance process, how governance is anchored around walking, uh, walkability of Kisumu city, uh, the specific features that have been put up to encourage walking and as well as the impact and the objective of developing such features. So then uh, I begin to uh, uh, highlight, uh, just to give you an update of what is coming up um, of how Kisumu is right now. And, and to me, this is the perfect walking street, if you asked me. 
uh, Kisumu, it has the, 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 the tree canopy, the green strip, not much of a concrete jungle really. And as well as giving, giving the, the ample space for walking with the right kind of design with 150 meters raised from the carriageway. So if you asked me, that's the perfect walking city, rather streets in Kisumu. And so what informed uh, the development of, of policies around walking and or, or sustainable transport as a whole is uh, the scenario of the transport scenario of, of Kisumu and um, which they realized that a lot of people are buying cars or getting into motorized transport yet uh, the need is 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 of the opposite really and so if we look at the model share uh, that was revealed from the study done by ITDP while preparing the mobility plan it shows you the majority of Kisumu uh, residents walk so this shows um that 53% 50, of, of the residents walk every day to work. It may be uh, as a result of choice or due to uh, limited economic capacity really, but the, the fact is majority of people walk to work and, 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 and the rest share uh, less than you know 50% uh, with public transport following closely. Uh, and so it means that there is those need to develop uh, an infrastructure that supported this large number of people who, who are working. So then if you look at the movement, uh, I don't know if you can see, if you look at the movement, movement per hour on the streets, it means that the, around here, the, which is the concentration of the, of the central business district, it shows you that majority of people are concentrated on the central business district. The, this is hourly uh, trips that they make. So it means there's a lot of movement here uh, as regards to working. So then what, what, what were the policies that were developed to govern uh, this um, or to, to come up with a, with a, with a, with a, a mobility uh, uh, policy that encourage walking and a sustainable transport really. So then it is anchored on, on Climate Change Act of 2016, the Constitution of Kenya and the County Government Act that uh, gives the County Government mandate to develop design and, and maintain roads. And um, the Constitution of Kenya created the County Government that now were replacing the local authorities. And so Kisumu City is under the County Government of Kisumu. And so then what were the other policies that, that encouraged uh, the development of uh, sustainable mobility in Kisumu is that in, in the uh, 2015, the Integrated Strategic Urban Development Plan was developed and approved by the County Assembly of Kisumu, uh, making it a legal document that is, was it, it was a plan that was aimed at guiding development of Kisumu. So they, this plan identified that Kisumu is expanding exponentially, expansively rather. And, and Kisumu being that it is just about 274 kilometer, square kilometer, it means that there ought to have been a, a dense sort of development rather than expansive development. So this plan also uh, recommended for uh, development of a sustainable mobility plan amongst other sectoral plans. The ICE would also uh, recommended for development of a special plan that would guide the special development of the city plan. Now the city plan, how did it address the walkability of the city? The city plan, which also uh, fortunately was made a legal document uh, in around May of 2022, identifies um, around five uh, growth, growth nodes or growth centers or poly centers. So it means that there will be neighborhoods, these neighborhoods that would you would have basic amenities and, 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 and services within a radius that people can walk or cycle. So then the, also the plan also provide, uh, recommends for a 40 kilometer promenade along the lake 
at the lake front, which is the major um, natural resource of, of, of Kisumu. So that encourages, it encourages walking as people enjoy that resource. So then um, with, the, with the support of ITDP, they started developing the mobility plan. And this plan came up with a, a number of recommendations. But the goal was to provide an efficient, uh, affordable, equitable, safe, and convenient mobility for all. And so a number of those recommendations were lifted and uh, informed the development of, of infrastructure, the roads, or shifted how we de designed the roads in Kisumu. And uh, most of the roads were had to be retrofitted to fit into the recommendations of the plan. And, um, and therefore, there was a project uh, with the non-motorized transport project that was started to be implemented in, in the year 2018. So it, it was being implemented in two phases. So if you look at the, the first triangle, which was um, a pilot, really, a pilot for the, for the non-motorized transport, it is, it's about, it's slightly below two kilometers. And, and it, it included the walkway and it included the, the tabletop crossing and it, it included the green strip and whatnot. So this was being a pilot that was, the county was learning a lot in terms of the design of, of a walkable city. And so the lessons that were learned from the development rather for the implementation of phase one of the non-motorized transport implementation were lifted to inform the development of non-motorized transport network for the phase two, which is marked in red. The streets, I don't know if it would be interesting to read because they, the names of the, of the streets are in, in the local language really. So then what were the specific features in the non-motorized uh, transport, we had the footpaths and the cycle tracks. So we had the drainage works and the service ducts. So then how did these um, features impact uh, the city? So first, uh, there was improved uh, public transport uh, through encouraging walking and, and transport, as a lot of people really rely, as I had shown in the chart above, a lot of people rely on walking and as well as public transport. Then the footpaths were developed that were wide enough to, for convenience of walking. So uh, it is important to know that previously Kisumu had a few streets, just a few streets had footpaths but they didn't look like they were intentional. They were, were quite narrow, they were dilapidated. And so these um, the footpaths were, the new ones that were designed were wide enough to encourage walking conveniently. And also um, there were clearly marked cycle tracks to avoid the conflicts of vehicles and the cyclist. And then how did the drainage works impact the streets? <laughs> It took care of the, of the storm water drainage uh, that prevented that we, we experienced frequent logging and, and erosion in the street. And so this improvement of the drainage works as a, a point to improve uh, walk, walkability was quite impactful. And so also the, the foot parts were raised uh, about 150 millimeters so that it encourages the flow of water. And, uh, and the drainage were, were properly covered so that they were, they were not endangering, endangering anybody's life. And so people felt safe to walk. Uh, other features included uh, the, the solar powered street lights. Uh, and that of course, so that people are encouraged to walk even at night and also prolong businesses to operate past even into the dark. And of course, the green energy aspect there because they are, they are solar powered. And, and so it means that we do not spend a lot of money on electricity. Now, um, if you asked me, street walking and, and street venting go hand in hand. And so we've experienced that quite a lot because um, in, the, in the past, uh, the street, street venting is a problem in Kenya, really, not just Kisumu. And so in the past, when the city tried to enforce that people go to their designated markets, you would, you, you would, it would be temporary and then after a short while they would come back to the street. So then how did the county take care of this? That 
for as long as people are going to walk on the street, there's going to be some component of street vending. So there were, were a few markets, the Huru Business Park and the Chicho, uh, Chicho Market that were built specifically to take care of these street vendors uh, so that they, they, they can still access their customers or their targeted customers who walk from work and to work in the morning. And so they're the vending just, uh, you know, um, retail products. So then that part was taken care of in the, and it was part of the NMT project. We also had a public toilet along the Mokenyata Highway, and, and I think uh, some more will, we are, are going to be developed as we continue to construct in uh, phase two of the non motorized transport network. And so these public toilets are just really to take care of, they, they are fixed with water, they're quite clean, there's, there's a maintenance system for them. For, so as long as you feel like, you know, uh, you know, to give you some sort of dignity to take care of the sanitary uh, uh, component of it, uh, we had also Ju the Judith, the can I interrupt? Sorry to interrupt just quickly. Um, yeah. But I see you've got 24 slides, but we are a little bit uh, running on time. So if you can try and cover the next lot of slides as quickly as possible, please, so that we can have some time for the discussion. Thank you. Sure. sure. So then we, we had street furniture as well, uh, uh, but you know, the benches and the plant is, as you'll see in the, in the following pictures as I make my presentation. So then uh, the following presentations would be just on the pictorial depiction of what has been going on, the transformation that has gone on in Kisumu Great. since the development of the, of the non motorized transport. So then you can see that is a street called Amolo Agar. You can clearly see the, the street, the street uh, lights and the clearly demarcated, you know, the green strip to take care of. The trees were maintained, and like in Nairobi, we did not cut any tree as we were developing the non motorized transport. There's the wall separating the roads and, and, and you know, the private development there. And then we have the fixing, as we, you know, you can notice they develop uh, as we, uh, you know, putting up the drainage, you can, you can notice the, the double cab separation. Um, that is, you know, the process of developing the non-motorized transport. This is a comparison of what used to be and what it, it is now. Uh, that is Jomo Kenyatta Avenue, the street that I said it is quite a deal, ideal. That photo was taken from afar. And you can see what used to be as, as, a, what, as, as a, you know, pedestrian walkway. And it, it was really not maintained. It was not quite intentional. So, really no one paid attention to sort of like a checkbox. We have a pedestrian walkway. And so this is what, how the street looks like now, except that on, on the opposite side of the road. So don't be alarmed of, about the cutting of the trees. Another impact we've had with the development of nine motorized transport is that we are now able to carry out coffee days as recommended by the mobility plan. So we have had three so far. Even though it is still, it is still uh, not quite welcome, we still face hostility, but we hope that in the future, people will, be eas will easily embrace, you know, cafe days and placemaking and, you know, people getting to, to enjoy the streets, uh, you know, the street as alternative uses as opposed to just motorized users. And so that, that is the pictures of one of the cafe days, the, you know, the, 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 the art groups, you know, experiencing, you know, the enjoying the streets, uh, we had, you know, cycling, one of the street cafe days. We had even the people with vulnerable, you know, with vulnerable groups. In this case, people using the wheelchair. We were demonstrating how they can use the universal crossing. Yeah, so basically that's it. So thank you. Well, that's fantastic, I must say. I, I, I'm sorry to have uh, interrupted you, it, uh, but those those uh, images are just fantastic to see those um, the delivery on the street. So the follow through from the plan all the way through to to delivery on the street. Um, it's really inspiring to see that. And there's some great comments in the chat about the need for this for other African cities. And I know other African cities um, uh, are are taking are starting to do some of this work and there's some some really great examples but i really appreciate thank you for sharing kizumu's story i think that is is very inspiring um 
and in fact, we had a chat very uh, question in the chat very early on um, about how to ensure the investment goes in the right place. And I think you touched on that a little bit, Judith, with having making sure you have a plan and identifying the key routes and the pedestrian flows. But the comment was that um, sometimes it's a tick box exercise rather than an effective implementation. And I wondered whether any of our panelists, Judith, Andre, Constant or Simon, if you had any other observations about how to ensure that the delivery happens where it's needed the most or, or where it, it can really make a change or what strategic choices did you make about where you started with uh, investment? Simon, obviously you've been doing school streets, but has that really given you that 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 solid uh, starting point for that, but perhaps uh, I start just with you again, Judith. Was was it the was it this planning phase and recognizing the pedestrian flows that allowed you to target your investment so um, carefully? If you're still there. Yeah. Yes. I'm sorry. Thank you. Yes. Yes. The, the, you, you know, it the planning process would would give us data. And then it would inform us, you know, if, if you work for exactly. government, how the budget allocations, you, they ask you, where do we prioritize our project? And then you, you, you give a plan. A plan is, is like, a, you know, a, a budgetary tool. Yeah, so great. The, the yeah. plan comes with, with data and, you know, so then. Yeah. Yes. So you started with the data and the analysis. Simon, I mean, you started with the school streets. What, how did that become the place that you started in Tirana? We, we were really interested in school streets because they're, uh, it, schools are one of the most evenly distributed uh, pieces of public land in the city, basically. They built schools historically where there were new population centers. And for that reason, they're really within walking distance of sort of the maximum number of people. So it was it was initially an access uh, thing. We also work on the same time on opening up the schoolyards themselves as public parks. So the, the school streets work in conjunction with with um, open school yards. But um, but, you know, I, I really I believe very strongly that um, this kind of work really depends on it. Building momentum is huge. And it depends on early wins. And I don't know of any project that is, is as clear and digestible to the public and to municipal partners than a school street. And for that reason, I, I really extol their values to as many people in as many places as I, as I can. I think we should all be building a school street at every school um, in, in our cities because it just makes so much sense. And basically, in that momentum building, you also have the opportunity to build understanding um, with, you know, among the public about what healthy walking infrastructure is and why and how it feels. Again, we need good concrete examples of this to be felt, not to be told. I don't, you know, yeah. for, for yeah, so many- Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. And, and, you know, what we find so much is po po politicians at the same time need to see it, like, the, you know, the, giving a policy brief data they're like okay cool but like what what does it give me you know and I so think I'd like to jump off that point about the politician I think that's really interesting because Andre talked about these walking meeting routes and this sort of experience of people using these meetings and it created a bit of conversation in the chat but I'd like to go back to our, our presentations this morning with the Asian Australian uh, group because in Queensland they identified the high impact of just taking practitioners and politicians for a walk in their local community for the very first time. And I remember doing this for years in the early days, just getting people out of decision makers out of their cars and onto the streets to understand the experience. Um, but uh, has has been a constant sort of thread through our work. But in Queensland, they, they're literally actively using it now as a paradigm shift um, engagement tool um, yeah. to, to I guess it's to touch the hearts as well as the minds is one way of expressing it, but to, to show that it's the experience as well as the, um, the technicality or the engineering of the experience, uh, uh, the engineering of the space that matters. And um, I think that brings me nicely back to you, Andre, because you started with creating place and, and, uh, and then moved out into the mobility um, agenda. Did you want to reflect briefly on the, this meeting routes, this walking meeting routes, because it does generate some, some conversation and, and has that helped that leveraging the, the walking agenda in your city? 
uh, yes, uh, but, but first, let me tell the first thing about uh, what you say about uh, engaging uh, politicians. We, um, we re uh, recently went with, uh, to Alderman uh, with people in a wheelchair. We walked to the city to uh, experience them how it, and they all, were, all, all also wore a, a blindfold to experience how people walk when they're disabled. So that, that's, a lot, that's an important uh, thing to do. And on the, the, the case of uh, making uh, priorities, I think we have two ways. It's the bottom-up approach, like uh, Genji with people, uh, like uh, schools, but also uh, in our Rotterdam, we made priority maps. So we defined where streets are uh, not green, they have uh, a lot of cars, uh, there's also a, a bit of a heat problem. So you know where you can put your trees and they they benefit pedestrians. So that's one way to also to prioritize on a network scale. And uh, this weeding route was also, it, it was a, it's kind of way to, to, to uh, also uh, promote to employers to engage people in walking during their uh, daily workday. Uh, so it's it, instead of uh, booking a room, you book a weeding yeah, in, 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 yeah. in the system, and then you go you nice. you uh, you ask people to join them in the in the in the walk and and meet as well. So that's so also you're improving. Uh, sorry, just to just to capture that you're improving workplace culture, you're improving the green uh, infrastructure in the city, and you're improving the public health and the and the public realm all in the in the same time. And also the awareness of the importance of walking, and they can also. <laughs> advocate yeah. to other people as well so that's yeah. uh that's a nice, nice way to, to 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 collaborate it's a nice way of bringing all those different elements together mm. isn't it that sort of just bringing those different things and i know in cities um perhaps um like we're well, like in Kisumu and and some of the the signs sites that Constant shared with us in the African context, people don't want to walk as far as they have to. You know, they're not they they don't want to choose. They're not choosing to walk. They're walking these long distances, and uh, we are doing a lot of work in this area with you know and, and people like ITDP to at least make it safe and comfortable for them when they're mm. walking. But we need those connections with public transport to reduce um, the distances. I wonder, Constant, if if you had any reflections on you had you gave us such a comprehensive overview do you have any reflections on where you see some of the best leverage and those best places to start we've heard about data we've heard about children and you know coverage of the city and engagement i just wanted to as we're coming to an end if you had any other final remarks for the for the conversation today um yeah I th well there's one there's one thing that came out was, uh, clearly is about uh tree planting and, and, and or, or or the opposite the uh, dissemination or the dissemination of trees in the name of road expansion which is uh, a tendency that somebody has pointed out in the somebody has pointed out in the in the chat chat yeah. group and it's a tendency that we've been seeing even when that expansion does not cover those particular places where the, the, the greenery is being chopped down and the usual excuse is we'll plant more but remember it takes a whole generation to for just one of those uh, hardwood trees to, to grow so that's a, a, another area that i think needs to be looked at because when you do that even if you put uh, uh, walking infrastructure you will you already make it more difficult for the for somebody to walk there because you've taken away the shade and and uh, all you know what would actually have made it more attractive for those people yeah it's a terrible bind isn't it that uh, we've, we've just seen we must be planting trees to invite people to walk but they're, they're still being cut down in the interest of road expansion and uh, we've no under no delusions of the challenges that we face to uh, to address the balance but i think personally i have been inspired by the presentations we've got um we've had this morning and um we're we're nearly out of time um, I don't see any other uh, core questions in the chat that we've answered. Um, the presentations will be uh, available online, the, the, the YouTube. Um, there's been some good clarity around the fact that we are talking about walking um, and the importance of identifying the modes um, differently, but the challenge we still have 
to, to sustain the momentum that we can see growing. And that's what this platform is all about. But the momentum of the plat momentum that the platform wants to offer relies on all of you and sharing your case studies. So um, I invite you to, to engage with the platform, have a look, send us your ideas. We'll be developing and expanding it over the next year. It just leaves me time to thank our speakers. Thank you very much for your contributions and for your insights. Um, it's absolutely brilliant always to hear the differences, even though these different cities, there's so much to learn from, from each other. And thank you, Constant, for the perspective from uh, the advocate uh, there and the audience for your engagement and for your time today. Um, I want to thank Ralph for doing all the, the work to, to bring the webinars together and also acknowledge the FIA Foundation who have funded this work um, and are continuing to help us uh, to promote walking. Um, we look forward to seeing you again at Walk21, continue to engage with the platform. And, um, and I just wanted to pick up on a final comment from the chat. Um, they said, what about that case study from Lagos? Did you get the right level of community engagement? Well, we aren't, we aren't here to have just one case study from, from Lagos. So feel free to share your case studies. Feel free to, to present more material from 